What I love most was the performance and the preparation and the adrenaline of being in a room of 12 people that don't know you, don't like you, don't care about you, and convincing them of your side of the case. That right. is selling from the stage. Yeah, that's right. That was my first time selling from the stage, was being in a federal jury, doing the opening statement, and getting them to see my client who was incarcerated as a human being that they could relate with more than the doctors, the prison guards, and the people on the opposing side. That's selling from the stage. Mm -hmm. Welcome to another edition of the Social Proof Podcast. We find amazing people, dope people that did dope stuff. You're no different, right? Nope. You're amazing, right? Yeah. Successful? Yeah. Well, what are you qualifying that as? Uh, successful? Is a, that was a trick question, actually. A loaded question. Are you successful? I qualify success as loving what I'm doing and being excited every day. Mm. Mm. Living outside my comfort zone. Not living in fear. Like fear doesn't rule me. It's not my master. Yeah. That's success. And the millions help. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> the millions do help though. That helps. Um, Ashley, what is going on? Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Oh man, you and I both. So we were just talking before this and I'm learning that you are a very interesting person um, and have been successful on multiple fronts. But right now, You've recently transitioned to a new business model, yes. but by trade, you're an attorney. Yep. Federal trial attorney. Federal trial attorney. Yep. You took some people to trial. Okay. So tell me what's going on with YSL. Do you follow it? YSL? With young oh, No, I don't follow it. I'm I do sorry. a little bit. I just be watching it. <laughs> I need to get off. The, I need to stop. I don't, I don't follow it. Yeah, because that it literally has nothing to do with me or my life, but it's just so entertaining. <laughs> and I don't know what's going on. It's like people getting pleaded. I don't know. I I, I don't know. It's criminal? Yeah. yeah. So we don't know. So I was civil. So okay. I represented big companies at trial. Okay. Big companies that did what? So no one goes to jail at the end, usually. So I was on the side where, like, if something went wrong, all that would happen is somebody writes a big check. So it was civil. So, like, mm. let's say a group of employees didn't like their employer, and so they did a class action lawsuit against one of their employers. Right. I would represent the employer. Oh, gosh. I hate them joints, too. I, got, I, got, I get those in the mail, and they give you, like, $3. Like, why am I going to take my time to get? But I guess, I guess they have to, like, pay out a lot of people with these class action suits? I guess, see, but that was on the plaintiff side because in law, like for me, when you go to law school, there's all these different lawyers, but the average lawyer in Illinois makes $60,000. Mm. That's not enough money because you pay about $300,000 to go to law school and you wow. have all these student loans. So I looked up who were the highest paid lawyers. They all represented large companies, but in what they call big law. So one of the top like 20 law firms in the world. So I wanted one of those jobs. So I would go right. to work and then these companies would... Um, need help like if you heard of the bp oil spill yes okay yep, um the ignition switch cases never heard of that okay so any of the like the B, take bp bp needed lawyers to represent them in all of the mass litigation that happened after that mm. so those types those were the types of cases that the firms i worked at would take on gotcha okay that doesn't sound that's not the dream job it was my dream job. Mm -hmm. But then I got in and I'm working like 18, 20 hours a day. And it like what I love most about it was the money. I didn't love the, the 60. Work. Or you no, 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 no. So that's average lawyer. I was about to we say that. Like, my starting <laughs> salary out of law school, my offer was $200,000 or $180,000. Oh, nice. Yes, yeah, so that was pretty decent. For and sure. then I negotiated up to about $300,000 when I switched firms. I negotiated a six figure raise to go to another firm. And you I were like making three hundred thousand as an attorney. Yes, and I was young. I, I mean, what twenty eight? I don't like. Wow, not not that old, you know. And so for me, but but again, I liked the money more than the job. And the problem with that is, I don't think you can become a master of something if you don't have at least a little bit of affinity towards it. Yeah. And so I was working so hard, and I was getting good, but I felt like. I couldn't be world class at it because I just didn't love it enough. So I started interviewing all the partners at the firm who were really exceptional. Like these dudes making 30 million women, five, 10 million dollars. The a year. employees at the job. No, no, no. The partners at this firm. Like the, these, they're tech. I mean, they're oh, partners, the people who, but they'll start the firm. 
And then, how's the partners work? Because I'm trying to understand. We're going to get to your story, but I'm trying to understand this corporate structure. Okay, okay, okay. This is good. Now, if you look up big firm salaries, it's public. We get paid on what's called like a market scale. So all, you know, large firm lawyers, it's like you make 180, then after that you go 220, you go 300, whatever, unless you negotiate another deal. But the partners, the lowest paid equity partner, who is just an employee who raised through the ranks and was voted in as a partner, meaning they pay a little bit of money and now they're called a partner, but they can still be fired, right? Mm -hmm. But they're a partner in this large law firm. You pay a little bit in, but the lowest paid equity partner at my first firm was reportedly making around 1.2 million. Mm. So I was going, if I would have, I was on partnership track. I could have become a millionaire in my day job. However, I just didn't love it. So I started interviewing all these partners. Now 1.2 was the lowest paid, but some of these guys were making tens of millions of dollars. That's who I wanted to interview. And I would ask them, you know, how did you get here? How were you making all this money? What did you have to do? And they loved it. Like they didn't just love the money. They loved the work. Yeah. And I went to breakfast with one of them one day, one of my mentors, and he sat me down and he was like, Ashley, if you want to be rich, this isn't rich. Tens of millions. He's like, that's not rich. He's like, you need to. Yes, be it is. He was yes, like, it is. is. He, hey, I'll yes, tell you I looked that me. man right in his I'm, face. <laughs> you are lying to me, bro. <laughs> what I'll are we talking about said. right now? He said, you want to be rich, you need to be the CEO. He said, I just sat in a boardroom with presidents, kings. And CEOs, and there was a woman in there who reminded me of you, and I know she's making more than every lawyer at this firm. Mm. And she's not giving me what you're giving me right now in terms of fearlessness. You need to be the CEO. And that's when I was like, I ain't leave then because I I didn't have that guy. I I ain't have it like that. I couldn't just, (laughs) I wasn't like, now today is the day. It was more like, that was just, it was something that he deposited into me. And I just, I sat with it. I didn't Mm. negate it. You know, and to anyone watching, especially my women, my sisters, right? Like, don't, when people say stuff like that to you, don't, oh, no, not me. I don't think so. Mm. (laughs) I can't do it. Well, Lord, say the same. You know what I mean? You know how we do? Like, don't do that. I just sat with it. I didn't know what to do with it, but I was like, I, like, let me look into this more. I need Mm -hmm. more information, (laughs) you know? But he, he told me that and it really changed my life. And so working at a place where people were already making millions in a job, I didn't come into entrepreneurship with this whole quit your day job, you can't be rich, blah, blah, blah. I just knew that there are environments of extreme abundance and they're typically not diverse. I was the only black woman in litigation. They hadn't made a black woman part. It was founded in like 1909. They hadn't made a black woman equity partner until like 2016, 17. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? And so there's like, but 1909. And so it wasn't a lot of representation, but I knew that if they're telling me this, there was something more for me to do. A hundred percent. So how long were you at the job? The first one, I started in law school. Yep. You got out, made 180. Mm -hmm. You were there for how long until somebody else gave you 300? Oh, I was only there full time, I think two years. And then I negotiated another job. So in law school, I had several job offers. Mm -hmm. This one, if you go and do the job thing, get multiple offers. So I had several job offers, but I didn't take one of the job offers. But I always stayed in touch because I had this rule. Mom, don't be mad. I'm about to say this because it's about to be a curse word. I try not to curse. on. (laughs) I'm not going to curse, but I'm going to say what I thought. I heard Tyra Banks say, like, you need FU money. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I don't have FU money, but I'm going to get FU job offers. So, like, for me, <laughs> I kept a job offer. You know what uh, I mean? It was, like, in the back pocket. Right. Um, so I just stayed in touch with everyone that wanted to hire me, even though I didn't accept with them. And every time I got a win at my job, I would tell them, like, hey, you know, this was really good. Oh, it's going great. They just gave me this award. How oh, are wow. you doing? You know what I mean? To just keep them warm, like doing a little marketing yeah, while at the job, you sure. know? And so it came a time I got really sick at work because I worked so many hours. It was great money, but we're talking 18, 20 hour days. One day I left the house on Tuesday, didn't come home till like Wednesday afternoon because I was just working. Like yeah. explain that to your husband. You're like, no, babe, I was just at the office. You know right, what I mean? Right, like you're out sure. all night, all day. And I learned work ethic, but it caught up to me like health wise. Because with trial, you don't know how long you'll be on trial. You just leave. Yeah. So I thought I'd be gone a week, but I maybe got, I was gone. One time I was gone like three weeks yeah. and you, I didn't even pack enough clothes. Like, so, oh, yeah, for sure. so it was really tough and I needed to take a mental rest from work. Mm-hmm. And my job that I put in all those hours for David did not call. Did not text, did not even, they didn't even notice when I came back. <laughs> and I'm the only black woman. I'm like, you don't see no chocolate and you don't think maybe she's gone. You know, like right, they did right. not care. Okay. And so 
I got in my feelings, which was my mistake, and I called this other firm. I'm like, yeah, you know, I was just out, you know, I was working too hard. They're like, oh, were they treating you bad over there? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. I want to I put a pin in it real quick because two days over the last, I would say two days over the last two months or so, I was not feeling well. I mean, I just wake up and like, I take a deep breath and I just feel like pressure in my chest. And I just, I feel like the symptoms of a cold and I'm just like, mm. I'm getting, I'm getting chills. And I lay down and my, my wife just kind of, she's like, yo, just lay down, just hang out, you know, I drank some water, lay down. Next morning, I felt great. It happened again, the second time. And my wife was like, yo, you need to go to uh, emergency care. That's what it's called, emergency, urgent care, urgent care. Mm -hmm. You need to go to urgent care. So I'm like, all right, cool. They checked me out. They like, you know, asked me all the questions. They say, well, take a Tylenol, go lay down. You know, if it doesn't, if you don't feel better, just come back. So I go lay down and I feel better. Like the next day, I feel, I just feel better. So I can only really attribute it to stress. And stress literally the only, like all I needed was to like lay down for a little bit and take off. And I felt better. And I say that, to, I say that like that story to say um, that it's real. However, I do want to ask you a question. I feel like to be able to get to the point where you respect and realize that your health is important and be able to be comfortable being able to take off, you have to work hard enough to experience that, to say, yo, I'm working too hard. You know what I mean? It's, all, it's like yeah. you can't have, it, like some people right now, they don't make enough to, how, how can I put it? To to pay attention to their health right now? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean self-care? Like you do broke for self-care? Is that, does that sound crazy? Does that sound it, crazy? I don't know, because my life, when I didn't have no money, I was, caring for myself a lot. I was relaxing. <laughs> right. Like I didn't have nothing. To, like I was chilling. Like my jobs, I was paying me a little bit of money. They couldn't, they, I wasn't about to be working. You know what I mean? Like right. it was, it was chill. So I don't have that experience, but I know there are like hardworking people mm. who are working like two, three jobs and they just got to make it work. But for, uh, for me, it was, it was that job that really just like, I just, I overdid it and the environment. So the entrepreneurship environment online is so, I was so blown away by how this whole thing works. So here, everyone's like self-care Sunday, self-care Monday. Don't let them people stress you out. In my old environment, it was like, <laughs> are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping? You are an associate. You don't sleep. Why are you like, it, everyone worked that mm. hard. So I didn't know what my husband is always like, you don't know what normal is. This is not normal. Yeah. I'm like, why isn't the team? He's like, cause normal people don't operate like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like in the real world, we don't work all night. If it, cause if the environment you know was crazy, we don't want to be normal people at all. We don't want to yeah. be normal people, but we, we do have to learn to work with cause it can, but the environment was not a healthy environment, mm -hmm. but it did teach me work ethic and thank God. Cause yeah. I do think people need work ethic. Here's the thing. I don't think there is an environment where extreme work ethic is going to be healthy. I don't think I don't think it's possible to have a healthy environment where the theme is hard work. I hope there is, <laughs> but it know. wasn't. You know, and, then, and here's the thing, the people that did have balance that would be like, hey, this is how you get balance in this work environment. They didn't have partnership. They didn't have status they didn't have the results yeah. they weren't seen by clients as best in class yeah. because the people that were best in class studied all the time they dedicated their lives to being great and i've just always i didn't i didn't want to be good like i'm yeah. anti-good yeah. i want it to be i want to do the thing that i can be world class at with continued work and dedication yeah 100 percent. goodness gracious okay so you leave the 180 you get the 300 when do you go out on your own? Because the next step was you starting your own firm. Yep. How long were you there at the $300,000 spot? Less than six months. And I really? know that because they gave me a $60,000 signing bonus. And the signing bonus said, if you leave within six months, you got to pay it back. 
And I had to tell them I'm not going to pay it back because that was going to be my seed money. But also, <laughs> but also I'm leaving because y'all don't respect me as a woman of color. And so it was a toxic environment for me. I interpreted the environment as one of toxicity and I just could not stay there. Mm, so they wowed you, they smoothed wowed you. Wowed you, told me you could work. Because oh, environment sure one, I could work there. from home. I may have worked a lot, but I could work from wherever I needed to work yeah. from. The first firm was very much so like we hire the best and we let them be the best and the best gets their work done, but we don't care where you get it done from. Yeah. So the next firm, I'm like, yeah, I need to work from home. I'm snapping my fingers. Where's my assistant? What's going on? They're like, you don't have that. We don't have paralegals. I'm like, great. I'm working late. Where's the nighttime assistants? They're like, we don't have nighttime assistants. I'm like, where is my car service? They don't got... Y'all ain't got none of my stuff. It's wrapped into that three hundred thousand dollars to get you. Okay, so they wanted me. I'm like, Lord, let me get on Fiverr. I need this. You know what I mean? Like it was crazy. And at firm number one, because that was my first ever professional law job, mm -hmm. so I thought that was that was normal for me. Yeah. Like having nighttime staff, having late night car service, ordering whatever you want. Them not checking if you order a hundred dollar meal or a two hundred dollar meal. That was not the place at number two. Okay, mm -hmm. and so. I asked my paralegal to come in my office and I got a, uh, the partner walks in my office and like, you know, you're making her feel insecure. You know, she has a law degree too. She's just working as a paralegal and you know, the paralegal did not look chocolate mm -hmm. who had a problem with me yeah. having oh, her come 100%. in my office. And I was like, Oh, so they was like, maybe you could go to her office sometimes. Maybe you could do, I was like, Oh, she went to law school, but didn't pass the bar and didn't get a degree and didn't work here as an associate. Oh, so don't that mean that she could come in this office? I don't play them games. Mm. So I told them, I started doing my digging and I realized I was the third woman of color who'd worked there, who'd left within a year or shortly thereafter. Got it. And I asked them why. I was like, why am I the third woman of color that left within a year? And they didn't like that question. And okay. then I had to have a meeting with HR and then they didn't like what I had to say. I didn't like what they had to say. <laughs> and then I left. No planning. I think I called my husband first, like I'm about to leave. And then I, my husband was out of town at a work event. I called my best guy friend at the time who was a writer, who that friend you call when it's like, bro, I got to get all my stuff out of here mm -hmm. at night. Chris is out of town. Come get all my stuff. And we moved my stuff out overnight. And I just never went back. Yo, first off, I just want to say, <laughs> you're a terrible employee. You're just not built for it. Like, you're just not, you're not a good employee. You know what I mean? Like, I would never hire you. This is crazy. So work for me? Oh, it's over. <laughs> you just ain't got it in you. You know what I mean? I didn't have it in me. I didn't have it in me. It but wasn't you, meant to be. But you raised some valid points. For one, you can, going through that experience is cool because you realize it's a lateral move. I make more over here, but yep. am I really making more over here, yep. right? But- and Obviously, culture. Yeah, for sure. At my first firm, all of it, I could be myself. I could bring up whatever issues I had. No one cared. Everyone was very direct. Everyone was very, like, confident. Like, everyone yeah. I worked with was confident. And they just were like, whatever. Like, yeah. it wasn't a deal. If I, if I felt like someone was being discriminatory, I brought it up at firm number one. They weren't like, you got to leave or we don't want you here. They were yeah. just like, explain to us why you think that. And I would explain to them why. And yeah. it was a conversation. But it, it's different cultures. Yeah. Like you have to find the culture for you. So I would always do my job, but nah, that whole like being not saying what's on your mind thing, mm. it just, it wasn't going to work. I bet. So six <laughs> months. So you waited until the, after the six No, no, I, I, it was before six months because they asked me for the money back. Really? And I had a conversation with them that was basically like, if you, I mean, I was like, look, this could go one or two ways. If you all come to me, and ask me for this money back and want me to pay it, then I want to go and publicly talk about my experience here to all those media outlets that I got be in. a whole lawyer. And I was like, or, talk talk. I was like, or we could just part ways and I won't even call the editor and do a story and name your name in the press. But either way, I'm making a call to the editor of this paper that I was recently in next week. Which one would you prefer? Hey. Cause this could go either way. Cause the whole time I was at that job, I was building my YouTube show. I was mm. getting my Instagram following up. I was building a personal brand and they, and I had won so many awards while there. I'd been an American lawyer. I'd been Crane Chicago business 20 in their twenties. And so one of the things I tell black professionals is corporations are typically hostile to us. Mm. So you need third party validation that you're great. So that when they come against you, you just have them Google you. 
Mm. Like you need somebody else like, no, 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 no. This is what she does. Cause it's never about the work. It's typically about like interpersonal issues. Yeah. But my thing is make it about the work. Cause before law I did sales and it was all about the numbers. Yeah. So make it about that where we can compete equally. For sure. But if you're making it like, I don't like her and I feel intimidated by her. I ain't going to win that game. Right. <laughs> like, you don't feel intimidated. Like you, I ain't going to win that game. So they, they didn't say, they just never asked for it again. I bet. <laughs> they I were like, imagine. let's just. Just let her, let her go be great. <laughs> I love that. All right, listen. Every single week, every episode, you hear me talking about the morningmeetup.com. It's the community. Let me show you what's happening here. Every single morning, Monday through Friday, there's 400 plus people on a Zoom call, right? We're learning, we're talking, we're growing together. And this is you. There's all these people here. It's all these people in the morning meetup. Hundreds of people reading books, growing. We get together quarterly. It's amazing. And for some reason, you just keep looking at, just go to themorningmeetup.com and get in the circle. And then you'll be like way happier. Just themorningmeetup.com. Let's get back to the episode. Okay. So <laughs> six months later, now you don't have a job. No job. But you knew you were going to start a company. Well, at the time, I knew that I could. So I, I had written a book called The Law School Hustle about how I went from almost failing out of undergrad to graduating top of my class in Northwestern Law through transferring. Um, so I had that book. But, you know, books, $20, that wasn't going to replace yeah, that sure. salary. Um, at this point, I'm sorry. What's your husband doing? My we're married husband, at this point, right? Yeah, we're married. We've been married oh, yeah, 10 married. years. 10 years. So, oh, congrats. Um, it'll be 11 years next year. And we were married. We were married. We got married right after undergrad. And what was, what was he doing? He was working in education. And what's your name? Because I don't want to keep calling you he. Chris. Chris. Okay, what's Chris doing? <laughs> Chris was working full time in education. Nonprofit education. Like a teacher? Uh, college counselor. College counselor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> I think he was liked it? it. I don't know. He liked it. Okay, oh, good, good, good. Okay. And he did, he was like director of a nonprofit, did college college counseling, worked in high schools on the Chicago's West Side. But like gotcha. our relationship was like, he's the good one. Like he's going to do good in the community. He's going to <laughs> pastor. He was an assistant pastor. We were very, very religious. Like he was the good one. Like he helped my intensity. Mm. Cause I'd be like, no, no, I'm nice. Look at the man that married me. It seems like you got to <laughs> talk her off a ledge on countless <laughs> Occasions. <laughs> so he was like, I'm like, just do a track though, don't they? Oh, that's amazing. Like, he's definitely the calm to my storm. Because um, I'd be calling him, like, and I'm about to tell. He'd be like, babe, babe, think about this. Think about this house we just bought. Think about. <laughs> So, you know, he was in education. I was like, hey, do whatever you do, what you want to do in education. I'm going to go get this corporate money. Mm. And he's like, you out here representing these companies. That's not like for the people. So I did a lot of civil rights litigation okay. pro bono, mm -hmm. represented um, men who were incarcerated in civil rights claims against oh. the prison and against the prison guards. Loved that work. And I made them pay for it. So yeah. that was my that was my moral, like, all right, give back. You I know, like, you, I'm going to do you. this. This is going to be good. They're going to pay for something. Right. Um, so but that's what he was doing. So you're out. You're out of a job. Out of and that. so in my, plan, my mindset was I'm a, I'm a sell this book, <laughs> but that ain't going to get me where I need to go. So I'm going to get book. a job. I wrote this book, the mm -hmm. law school hustle before, or after you got fired or before or I was writing it while at my job. Gotcha. But you didn't finish it by the time you left. I don't remember exactly. It was like mm -hmm. very close. I think I, it was probably done by the time I left. Gotcha. It, it probably just gotten finished by the time I left. Okay. Yeah. And my original plan was I'm going to start this business with speaking and this book deal. I don't want to call it a thing, but like it was, mm. it was a self-published book. It was, it was kind of a thing. <laughs> like it was a book thing. <laughs> it, was, it was not a book deal. It was a book thing. Right. right? <laughs> and I was just like, this is not, this $20 book is not going to get me there. And so I started speaking to colleges, but I would do bulk book sales. Mm. But even with that, it was like a thousand dollars. So I'm like, look, right. babe, I'm just going to get one other firm job so that I can make a little bit of money. Mm. And then I prayed this prayer. It was the most dangerous prayer I prayed, but also the best prayer I prayed. Dangerous. It was a dangerous prayer. It was, God, I want a job that's custom made for me. And at the time I prayed this prayer, I had um, and one offer and one potential offer from another firm. Literally, once I prayed that prayer within 24 hours, I lost that job. And every other firm that I interviewed with after praying that prayer was like, we won't hire you, which didn't make sense with my experience. Mm. And they didn't know how like 
They didn't know that I was going to come in there and shake it up. I kept that under wraps. <laughs> Law is kind of hush-hush about this stuff. They probably hate that I'm even telling this story. Right. <laughs> but, like, literally, I lost every other job. And I, I, when you say you lost the job, meaning you had the offers. They hired me, gave me the offer letter, and were like, you're in. Your start date is Wednesday. You just got to go through your background check, go through all your conflicts check. And the firm called me and was like, hey, you didn't pass conflicts, which literally means I worked on a case at one of my previous firms mm. that precludes me from working at this firm. Because it's a conflict, like either one of my old clients is beefing with the client at the oh, new wow. firm or something That's like that. But it's rare. And normally there's ways to get around it. I've never even met another lawyer who had a complex issue. And so That's I why thought, you're saying it's a dangerous Yes, player. because after I lost those jobs and I was crying and I was sad, I was like, I want a job custom made for me. And God was like, you're going to have to make it. Mm. And he was like, I ain't, I guess he was looking through the roll of eggs like, I ain't got nothing for sis down there. I got nothing for this girl, <laughs> Chris. You just stress nobody else out. I don't got a job for you, okay? You, <laughs> Good luck, my daughter. <laughs> I have equipped you for this. Hilarious. So yeah. then I just got on the internet and my husband, hate, like this was the period in our marriage where he was like, what is my wife doing? Because <laughs> I, I saw some girl on Instagram and um, she was making live videos and selling mm. these eBooks, but it looked like she was selling a lot of these eBooks. And I was right. like, Oh, maybe I could do that. And my husband was like, I know good and well, <laughs> <laughs> you did not leave this job to start getting on Instagram <laughs> and selling eBooks. And I would be on live. It'd be like four people there, David. Okay. <laughs> And Chris, Chris, he said, yo, he just said, that's a stretch. Maybe two, maybe two or three. Give me four, babe. And he would be like, those. And I'd be like, babe, look, they gave me a like. And he'd be like, a like? He was like, them people are gassing you up and you're not going to make any money. I was, Yo. I was like, <laughs> he was like, why don't you do law? Like, why don't you sell a trademark, right. sell a something? I was like, all right, I guess I could. I was like, it's all these trademark lawyers on the internet. I could sell some trademarks. Yo, like, believe it or not, yo, this is <laughs> this story is hilarious, but there's so many gems packed inside of this, right? Because you saw somebody doing something, mm -hmm. and you said, oh, I'll do that. <laughs> Yeah. But that ain't you. That it, and that's what he said. He was like, you've always been corporate. You've always been a speaker. You've always, he was like, why don't you sell what you know? Mm. But I didn't have, we had $60,000, right? Mm. But I didn't know. Oh, so when they gave you that 60,000 advance. Cash. You just saved it. Yeah, we pocketed that. How long were you at the firm? Was it six it months? Was, no, no, no. It was like four months, four to five months. Gotcha. So you just never spent that 60 grand. Oh, we spent a little bit of it. Okay. But <laughs> we spent a little bit of it, but we put a lot of money away in like our 401k mm, and all that other stuff. You. So I was like, if all else fails, we can, we have access to this amount of you. capital. I got you. Now, when I left my job, the other thing my husband did was it was the first time he, we had ever talked about finances. So mm. we've always had joint accounts because when we got married, we were broke. So we don't mm. have these issues. You know, they'd be like, I need a high value man that makes a million dollars because I make a million dollars. Like I made zero dollars. He made zero dollars. We figured it out. Like, yeah, so sure, we've always. Sure always had joint accounts but that was the first time he was like all right babe well if you made all this money this whole time like clearly we got like we should be straight i'd be like but the bags I, <laughs> right like, the like we got about 60 cheap. like that's all we had to show for it and that was including like our um our 401ks our like it just wasn't a lot of like yeah cash yeah um and there's so many said, like just as you're telling the story and i hope the audience is pulling from it. There's so <laughs> many gems in what you're saying. Like your story alone. Like I don't think we've <laughs> like taught something tactically just yet, but I'm getting so much from this conversation. Yeah. Like one, uh, I feel like we got to recap, like stop <laughs> trying to stop trying to be other people. And there's some people that like you, you, you have a, a an amazing skill set. But you're you just don't like the environment that you're in, right? Changing the environment doesn't mean you change what you do. It's just no. change, taking your amazingness to another environment to do the same thing, just 
in an environment that makes you feel better. Yes. And dissecting what you do like about the job. So I liked, I liked the money. I also liked the trial, mm -hmm. but with federal trials, I spent 80% of my time, probably 90% of my time preparing for the trial. Only 10% of my work was going into the courtroom and doing the fun part of cross examining, direct examining. And I only did one federal trial that I got to lead. Mm -hmm. And what was crazy about that, I did uh, three trials total where I was on the trial team, but I had done more trials than some of the partners. Mm. Even though it like just them three. And it was because some people never go to federal trial, even though they're federal trial lawyers. Got it. Because the cases are so massive and so big and so complex. Gotcha. But I knew I wanted to go to trial, so I would find all the trial lawyers. But what I love most was the performance and the preparation and the adrenaline of being in a room of 12 people that don't know you, don't like you, don't care about you, and convincing them of your side of the case. That Lord. is selling from the stage. Yeah, that's right. That was my first time selling from the stage was being in a federal jury, doing the opening statement and getting them to see my client who was incarcerated as a human being that they could relate with more than the doctors, the prison guards and the people on the opposing side. That's selling from the stage. Listen, if I was going to teach you how to make a million dollars, would you give me 10,000? Like if I had a course teach you how to make a million dollars and you're positive, you're going to make a million dollars. Would you give me 10,000? Of course you would. It's no brainer, right? So in a calendar year, we make seven figures with the podcast. But there's 21 things that I extracted from that that you're going to need to launch a podcast. But I only got time to give you three right now. One is you need a distribution platform. The distribution platform is what you upload your podcast to. That platform sends it to Spotify, Apple, Google Play, so that your supporters can actually listen to your podcast. You're also going to need a microphone. You need a really good microphone so it's crispy audio. And three, you need an income strategy. This is not necessarily a hobby, unless you're going to make it a hobby. But... I can teach you how I made the seven figures with these 21 things. Now, the good news is you don't have to give me 10,000. My ebook is only 37 bucks, okay? So listen, go to podcastebook.com and get the 21 things that you need. And I, I can explain it in detail, all the things that you need, okay? Podcastebook.com. Let's get to the episode. Mm. And my friend, shout out to Audrey Richmond, was the one who was like, that's how you, like that, that's why you're so good at selling from the stage. Mm. Like she was the one that like use what you got. Yeah. She was also the one who was like, you love serving black women. So do a black women live event, do a black women sales summit. Yeah. Do that live, teach black women experts who are like you, smart, educated, got money in their day jobs, just want more, how to get more. Yeah. Cause that population is underserved. Everyone wants to work with people who are, you know, like you ain't gotta know nothing and we'll teach you how to make a billion dollars. But like, what about the people that do know stuff? Yeah, for sure. They want to make money too. Yeah. So that became our niche. I want to fast forward, then we'll rewind. Okay. Fast forward, you now don't do anything with law. Not much. Outside but, of the current clients that we're closing out. Right. So this last event that you did. Yeah. You did one event. Speak Your Way to Cash Live. Speak Your Way to Cash Live. Yep. And how much did that event produce? 2.6 million in sales. 2.6 million in sales from yeah. one event. One event. Ticket sales and upsells. We had 150 in the room and about 60 virtually. 200 people. You made how much? 2.6 million. 2.6 million dollars. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's really cool. It was cool. The year you started your law firm, what year was that? 2018. 2018. Yep. So you got fired 2018. Yep. September, August, September. August, September, 2018. You got fired or you started the law firm? You know, I, all one blend. it's a little, bl it's like I got fired slash I quit. Like I probably could have negotiated to stay, but the, the meeting was going south. It was one of those, like I said some stuff I shouldn't have said. And then we, <laughs> so y'all fired. <laughs> okay. we'll, go, we'll go with fired. <laughs> the meeting went south. Oh, that is so much fun right now. Oh, uh, okay. That, that was that, but you got to so, block that out. So you quit that, you do these lives with these three, four people in there. And oh, then yes. you decide to open a trademark law firm? Yeah, trademark law firm. And this is 2018. 2018. So in f four years later, you're doing an event that nets you uh, over two and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. How long did you have your law firm? We still technically have our law firm. We are not accepting clients because with the law firm, you have to finish out all your cases. Gotcha. Um, but we had our law firm. We started in 2018 and we stopped taking clients January of 2021. 
January 2021, you stopped taking clients. Yep. Three, those three years, well, two years, technically. Did you make money? Yeah. We, the firm that got up to over half a million dollars and it was doing like around 700,000 in sales, over half a million in cash collected. We had a really great employee, a really great team. I, the mistake I made is I didn't sell my firm. I shut it down. Mm. I should have sold it. I should have gotten a business broker. I should have sold it. We had recurring revenue clients that were on legal packages from five to 15 grand a month. We really should have sold the firm. We should have sold the client list. We should have done whatever we could do to sell it. And I didn't. And I just got frustrated and needed to make a move that like I knew I was supposed to do this business. Mm -hmm. And I felt like selling it was going to be a whole lot of work, but I knew I was supposed to do this. So mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just going to do this. I made some calls about selling it, but I didn't go as hard as I should have. Gotcha. So I only say that because I know you have a lot of entrepreneurs watching, like find a business broker, get your company evaluated, sell it. Don't just pare it down because we owned our IP and it was, we have amazing clients and now we've been referring work out. Um, and thankfully, based on laws in Illinois, I found another Illinois lawyer I could have a referral relationship with. So we're still able to, you know, get a little bit of something, something. Gotcha. But even with that, because the rules are so weird, it would have been easier to just sell the firm. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So but we just the, pared it down. So the business for that for that two years made five hundred thousand. Or you're saying five hundred thousand a year? A year. Now the first year, no. Our first year, twenty eighteen, we probably made like six hundred dollars because I was selling me books. It wasn't good. <laughs> so so six hundred, like twenty eighteen, those couple of months, nah, nah, nah. And then the next six months of twenty nineteen, we made our first one hundred thousand gotcha. dollars and got up to probably around I think three hundred thousand dollars by twenty twenty. Yep. Um, twenty twenty or twenty twenty one. So it was the last tax cycle that we had for mobile for mobile general counsel, which is the firm. We filed for over five hundred thousand dollars before winding everything for that down. particular year. Mm -hmm. So really, you had to run from January. Let's just say, if I'm talking year January 2019 to January 2021. Yeah, but January 2021. You just started this whole speaking thing or what? No. So we did our first Speak Your Way to Cash live event in 2019. And um, what, what brought that about? I just kept getting at, So when we left my law firm, I had that book, The Law School Hustle, and I was bulk selling the book and going to speak at colleges. So they would buy 50 to 200 copies of the book. And I'd make a couple grand and go and speak. And I would also sell them on, hey, can I like get paid to speak and you buy books? So then we get it up to maybe like $3,000, $4,000. Um, and people were asking me, hey, how are you doing this? How are you going to speak in engagements? And I was like, I mean, you just ask. Like for me, it wasn't novel. It was like I took a list of all the colleges, cold called all of them, sent them all emails and made a speaking tour. Had a free intern that did a lot of the work. And then I just got booked. Did they pay you when you were making these cold calls? No, I made the cold calls to get the engagements. Right. But I'm saying, did you, I mean, were you just doing the tour? Nobody pays you. You're just going to do it. Oh or? yeah. So the tour, they would have to buy enough books for me to agree to waive my speaking fee. I got, and what was your speaking fee? 5,000 at okay. that time. So they're buying $5,000 worth of books. Now that would have been ideal, right. but because <laughs> but because I needed the money, now my clients are gonna be like Ashley. I cannot believe, but I think I feel like I've told them this because I needed the money. I would negotiate. So whenever we teach about like your speaking fee, your speaking fee could be a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, but the rate you get is the rate that you accept, right? And so. I would want 5,000, but they'd be like, we don't have it. We don't have any thousands, but we can give you, we can buy 200 books at $20 a pop. And so whatever that is, is that enough? And so I would come and then I would say, can I also sell books in the back of the room? And so I would speak and then Chris would come with me. So at this point, he's like, thank God, it's at least not an ebook. So he would come <laughs> with me. He would come with me he to hate, speak. He, he hate that little ebook, right? <laughs> but I mean, people, you know, the ebook didn't work because I didn't have an audience. Yes. And if I had an audience, the ebook would have worked. Right. But I didn't have an audience. I, it was four people, and them four, they wouldn't even. They would be like, "Amen," and With not buy. It was two. Two. <laughs> <laughs> With Danny, it was two like <laughs> he was like, "Yo, yeah, those twenties are like nine, eight, tens, but I keep them clean though." I didn't have an <laughs> audience, so mm, that that didn't work out. <laughs> that didn't work out. Them two was loyal. But the um, the book, so he would come with me and then I would speak and we'd mm. sell books in the back of the room. And he would tell me he was really good because he would watch. He was standing in the back of the room and he would watch like, OK, 
you're only going to sell like 15 books this time because they weren't as engaged. Mm. And then he'd be like, for your next session, because if you go to speak, maybe I do a one to four. So I'd have a one to 2 p.m. session, two to three and three to four. He's like, All right, next time when you speak, when you do your points, take the book and say, yeah, because this is in chapter four Got and wave the book you. when you speak. And then he's like, all right, now open the book. And then he's like, instead of saying it, just read a line off the book. And be like, all y'all who have your books, go to page 45. At the end of that session, wow. we would sell gangbusters a book. So now wow. we got thousands of dollars in cash. Cash is great. I love like that. cash. For sure. And we're out on the town. He's like, yo, this could maybe work. And I'm thinking, okay, this is cool. So we did that a lot. And we would speak at all these colleges. But then. Um, Hold on real quick because I can't speed past it. <laughs> That's brilliant. And it's really cool because I never really thought about having someone there to get a different perspective. Yep. And you do it enough. You're like, ah, no. We, and the fact that you know this is not going to be one. Of, maybe yep. you spoke good. Yeah. But we are not going to sell a lot of books. And having someone noticing that stuff. Yeah. I don't think I've. I don't think Even I've virtually you need that, David. Like we just did a, a webinar before coming here. Yeah. He was on there like, yo, they were lit in the chat when you did this analogy. But, hey, it looked like some of your mastermind members were, like, buying tickets, but don't they get it in the mastermind? All right, next time you're going to say, hey, mastermind, this is already included for y'all. And then make sure, and then even down to, like, he'll tell me, hey, you told them to drop a 12 in the chat, drop an 11. We didn't know as a team what those keywords meant, so we can't pull the Zoom chat and follow up on the sales tip. So next time, you need to make sure that the keyword is this, so we know those are hot leads. Wow. So we really, like, after our launches, after our webinars, after we sell from, like, even a virtual stage, I go straight to Chris because Chris is never impressed. He loves me, but he's never impressed. Like, I'll go to an event. They'll be like, Ashley, what's up? I'm like, oh, my God, babe. They love me here. He'd be like, they're gassing you because the whole time <laughs> you had toilet paper on your shoe and you were looking ridiculous. But I didn't want to interrupt your. <laughs> so I'll be hyped like, they. I killed it. That felt so good. He'd be like, the sales say no. Like we need mm. to. So because sometimes as a speaker, you could feel like you just, oh, <laughs> Killed that. Right. But if you're speaking to sell, the evidence that you crushed it isn't the applause, it's the check. And Dan Kennedy Ooh. always talks about that. Like, you thought you did good. Okay, but what the numbers say, you know? Yeah. And he's my check and balance. And then I know how to come up with different stories. I'm going to study success science. I'm going to study what I need to say. I'm going to look at great speakers. That's why I like watching your podcast. You're such a great interviewer. And yeah. people are so comfortable because you leverage empathy. I don't know if you know, like when I look at it, I'm like, man, David leverages empathy so well because that's what Chris does. Dude, and well, yeah, also, well, here's, here's the great thing. I don't even know what that, know what that means. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I leverage empathy. Empathy, Reese, like Reese. Reese don't never be like, yo, man, bro. I like how you leverage that empathy, but you gotta <laughs> never, <laughs> never told me. You know what I mean? Okay, leverage so explain, empathy. explain that. Maybe okay. I can act like so, I did purpose. Chris is a pastor by nature. He's in education. Mm -hmm. Um, he is someone who really will take the time to understand what other people are going through and try to feel what they feel. Mm -hmm. Try to put themselves, put himself in their shoes. Yeah. My personality type is not set up for that. Mm -hmm. So my personality type is more like, what's the problem? How can I fix it? How, do you want me to pay you? Well, you need some money? What you, like, what do you need? But I don't always take the time to put myself in someone else's shoes. I can be sympathetic, but my brain works so fast, I'm not always empathetic. But there are some people like who are naturally inquisitive, not just about what other people do, but how it makes them feel, how they're like, like you, you care about not just what they're going through, but how they feel as they're going through it. Yeah. And then once you're like that, if you're in a sales environment, you can then be like, oh, okay, so the real objection isn't the money is that last week you just filed for divorce. Mm -hmm. And so you really ain't feeling none of this. How about this? I know the deadline is Monday. Can we just talk next Friday? Like, I just want to give you a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like the way that he connects, which is why he does one-to-one -one sales to our coaching clients and our, co and our, um, our corporate clients. But I sell from the stage because yeah. I like the scale of it all, you know? And so it works. It's a really good, it's a good balance. So gotcha. on your team, I do think extroverts, introverts, different styles, how people are naturally, how they naturally experience the world is how you have to decide your sales medium. That makes sense. You have that idea to do this in 2019 mm -hmm. because people are asking you, how'd you, get how'd these, I get paid to speak? How'd you yep. get paid to speak? How many people were at the first event? 10 people. 
Exactly. In a conference room. I don't, we didn't even have an upsell. I didn't even know what an upsell was. Like, How much I, was the event? Like, okay, now, this is another thing. <laughs> the event <laughs> price was $300. We just go, because we could just, Come on. I could just tell you. 100%. Okay. It's over now. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but like, okay, the event price was $300. Mm-hmm. When I saw the ticket sales were slow, we were like, all right, we're going to DM people on Facebook and say, hey, looks like you're interested in the event. You qualify for a 50% off scholarship. So then people mm-hmm. were like, oh, I could do the scholarship. And they, we had them up, up. We were like, you qualify, but you need to apply. Fill out this Google form. I didn't do no hot. T- I didn't have no funnels, right? It was like a Google form. All I knew mm-hmm. was Google form and Eventbrite. Mm-hmm. So all y'all getting caught up on funnels, just... Just forget about it. Google Form and Eventbrite, they're still around. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did. And then when we saw ticket sales were still low, we'd be like, sis, you want to come for free? <laughs> you want to pull up? <laughs> you qualify you for 100% come? scholarship. You want to just hit, you want to just show up to this thing, and, you know, it, whatever you got, love offering, you know? <laughs> and so it was 10 people. And and the thing about it was, David, I remember being lit at them 10 people. Mm-hmm. Like I made my first sale online and I was, it was like $30. I was like, Chris, when I, I would call him at work all the time, Chris, I just made a sale. $30. He's like, here she go again. <laughs> she got to get her mind right. My money right. mindset was off, I guess. But it but it was because I interpreted every sale as opportunity. Yeah. I didn't look at like, oh, I didn't make a million yet. I wasn't on Instagram like, oh, she did a nine-figure launch. $30. I'm a loser. I was just like, $30, this is great. Someone yeah. wants to hear me talk about what I love. And they showed up, and it was great. And I just told them, go home. And then they were like, what else? Like, well, we need more. And I was like, I guess I'll do another event. And we didn't, we didn't have an event budget. We, <laughs> we uh, snuck into WeWork because he worked there during the day. So on the weekends, I was like, yo, no one's there. We did, we snuck, we did the WeWork play four times. Oh, wow. Like, it, and I don't want to say snuck in. We had a key. WeWork, don't come after me, Lord Jesus. But we had a key, you know, but like we literally just used the WeWork space and that was it. We just had a conference room in WeWork. Okay, 2019 first event. Did you do any other events in 2019? I think we did four our first year. So we did one a quarter. Okay, so and early 2019 you did one. Mm-hmm. Ten people. Yep. Some paid, some not. Right, right, right. We did another one. We did another one. About 15 people. 15 people. Some paid, some not. We did another one in Atlanta, actually. About 15 people. Where was Where was this one at? Chicago. Chicago. So our okay, first yeah, one Chicago. was in Chicago. Our second was in Chicago. I think our third one was in Atlanta, um, and then we did another one. How many people were in Atlanta? In Chicago, about 15 people. 15, okay. And then we did another one in Chicago. And the one we did in Chicago, I think it was our fourth one in Chicago. It was like 30 people at that one. Oh, it's lit. And I was just like through the roof. I was like, this is it. And most paid at this point. Most paid. I think everyone paid at That's that point. That's exciting. Same $300? Yes. And it was okay. only one day. And we did have, so I ended up figuring out that I was supposed to have an upsell of these things to like further help people. Yeah. And I did, but like, it wasn't, it wasn't wild. It was, it was, I didn't even know what I was doing. Let me ask this. Okay. So we do an event, a few people, we make no money. Second, no money. Third, we they travel. Make, you make a little money, like meaning, three, a thousand, two thousand. That's a little money. Well, I mean, <laughs> it still costs to put it on the, the time you do yeah. it or whatever. Yeah. Right. What is, was the goal just growing these events just for the ticket sales or did you see some? It wasn't strategic. It was just my outlet because I was doing law, but I liked law. I just felt like when I led with lawyer, I was placed in this box of doing someone's trademark and the internet, you know, like. It was just like, the, it was like, oh, you're an online lawyer. Trademarks, terms and conditions. And I was like, I was a federal trial lawyer. I used to pay a lot of money for this. You know what I mean? And they'd be like, ooh, 2000 seems rough. Like, <laughs> like what? Well, I didn't go to Northwestern for this. You know what right. I mean? And so I did this as a way to do something I love. Mm-hmm. And it was an easier way to make money than law because trademarks okay. still took a year. And I told my friend this, if I did a $2,000 trademark, and you divide 2000 by 12, I was only getting a couple hundred per month that I was servicing a client right. as a Northwestern lawyer who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars Facts. on a degree. So this, it was one day, but I'm making, you know, two or 3000. And then eventually, I don't remember which one it was that I started doing an upsell, but I had a 5k upsell, three people bought it. And after that, I was like, oh, uh, this, this is way better over here. Yeah. So 2020, we're doing an event, but that's, 
That's that's the that's C nineteen. Now twenty twenty was when we were gonna have our first event, like big event. We were gonna yeah. get a venue. We were gonna go all out. And that was when COVID hit. And this is yeah. also, by this time, I also wasn't selling books to speak anymore. Yeah. By this time, if someone wanted me to speak, it was $15,000. And I was getting paid twelve dollars to $15,000 to speak virtually because of the pandemic. Right. And I was licensing things to companies. So if a company wanted to license something, they pay five k a month to license a recording that I pre-recorded. And really? so, yeah, so the pandemic was... Are these still schools or these corporates? Or? Colleges and corporations. So at this point... I did colleges and corporations. So w was the process still the same of just like cold calling, trying to get, but I'm, no. I'm, I'm asking these selfish questions because <laughs> I think I'm going, I think I'm going back into speaking. I, no, I haven't been wanting to speak like that, but people will be, I, I get booked for certain things and I enjoy it. So it's fun. it is, but the, I will say this, I will say this. Like, let's say social proof has an event. Mm -hmm. I go to speak at social proofs event. It's very fun. Social proof probably wouldn't pay me as much as like the Omaha Association of Accountants. For sure. Not as fun. But yeah. hit me up if y'all in that group. But like <laughs> not as fun. But they gonna run with the 2025K because they need really qualified speakers to go there. But if and I what go are you speaking to on? I speak on confidence. Okay. So I did a TEDx talk. So this is the new strategy. We did a TEDx talk called The Currency of Confidence. And The Currency of Confidence is something we have a registered trademark on that name. It goes through the mindset, beliefs, and actions of successful people. Mm -hmm. And so when I do the talk to college students, I sell it as mindset, belief, and actions of successful students. I do it to entrepreneurs. It's the same framework, but it's for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And if we do it for corporations, it's the same framework, but it's for highly productive executives, That's right? True. And so we didn't, because I was doing all these little talks and I had to make a new talk every time. That was not time efficient and it didn't allow me to then bring in a consultant who's cheaper than me to give the talk so I get paid for the speech but I don't have to give the talk mm. so I needed a framework that I own so I got the trademark for it so the IP lawyer that worked out and for a while I hired my own firm to do all my trademarks hold so, on hold you know. on hold on you trademarked a presentation I trademarked the name of my presentations we probably have on file over 20 trademarks we trademark all of our names. Um, I trademarked Speak Your Way to Cash. I trademarked the Currency of Confidence. And I trademarked the Love Method of Communication. And I trademark the paid methodology, the MBA method. Any framework I teach in my program that has a name affixed to it, I'm going to file a trademark for it. So mm. much so that we have part-time in-house counsel that literally works for our firm to quickly file all of our trademarks. If we get an idea, we're sending it to our in-house counsel and we're getting it trademarked. Because mm. when I sell my stuff to colleges, to corporations, any of those entities, I'm not selling me. I'm selling the talk. That way, if they come back and say, oh, we don't have your $25,000 to speak, I can be like, all right, what's your budget? Like, oh, we got seven. Okay, cool. I already have the slides written. I already have everything done. I bring in a consultant who I pay hourly maybe 80 to 100 an hour. Like, hey, I need you for four hours to prep and give a talk. I give them their hourly rate, but I pocket the rest because I own the IP. You too good for a $7,000 speaking gig? Y'all got me on the seven? I mean, you know, we make something happen. <laughs> make something but that happen, is maybe. lit. That's, so if they don't pay your full fee, you just give that person a presentation. They obviously have to be good communicators. They have to be good. And, and here's the great thing about training speakers. Sometimes I can, if I don't give them, if I don't take it and I don't do it in-house, I still will take sales calls for speaking engagements to vet it. And for my clients who are trained in our programs, I've been able to refer five-figure contracts. Mm. I've been able to refer and not even on some like, and give me a cutback of it. I'll do it now. We may formalize like a speaking agency, but sometimes you do it because you you coach people like there's people who are excellent who just need that first paid engagement yeah. to believe that it's real. Mm -hmm. And then they're up yeah. like we the clients who we've been able to look that you're doing the pitching, you're doing the work. It's just a sales process. Yeah. Like who I am now wasn't created this year. It was it was like my whole life and my parents gave me a lot of confidence and my husband, you know, I have a really great husband. Like he yeah. we've been we grew up together. We got married at 22 and 23. Oh wow. So all of that, if someone else doesn't have all of that, it may take them a little bit longer to get the confidence to really sell their self and sell their services. So if we can help them, then that's that's great for us. We love referring business. That's hard selling the speech. Yeah, you sell the you sell the framework and it's proprietary. So once they buy in, they didn't buy in on a confidence speaker. They want the currency of confidence program. You can only get that 
from our firm. You cannot get this anywhere else. Because if you do, they're violating our IP. We didn't license it to anyone else to get it. So now you're an expert. You're pricing outside the market because you're the only one. That's why diamonds cost more because everyone can't afford them. That's where you want to be. This is incredible. I got some little frameworks too. That would be yes. dope. And Joe, you can just go speak that joint, bro. And I'll give you some bread. <laughs> <laughs> And Yo, free market. That is, I never even, I never heard of that, I don't think. Trade market. And, and that's the thing is like most, um, what's out, th what's the information out there about trademarks is like, you need a trademark so nobody steals your brand. But the truth of it is, this is the truth. This go, I, I love my trademark lawyer colleagues, but this is the truth. Most people who are buying a trademark for that ideology can't afford to defend their brand if someone steals it anyways. Mm -hmm. So the real reason you want to use a trademark when you're just starting your business is so that you can leverage it to make money. Because if you have an only statement, like, hey, we're the only firm in the world that teaches the paid methodology. So if you want to learn our step-by-step -step process and you want to learn this methodology, you have to learn it here. So and you know you can you can affirmatively say that, no cap, as the young folks say, because you own it. It's in the registered trademark database. Anyone else that's using it is literally stealing from you. Wow. Selling the methodology, selling the process, selling the transformation, because it's not necessarily that especially if you're not like a celebrity, right? They're not booking you because you're a celebrity. They're booking you because they feel like you can get them a certain outcome. Yes. Until you become a celebrity. Mm -hmm. But at, as of right now, if you can get people an outcome, it doesn't matter who delivers the message as long as yep. they get the outcome. Yep. And that's why you have to sell them on the outcome and you have to use we language in your sales calls. Cause what you don't want to do is be like your whole website's like I, me and my dog. And then you on there like, Oh, our consultants are going to, they like, what consultants? God, like, you. Got like you, I thought got it was you. you and your cat and your dog. Like, where are these consultants coming from? So you want to always use that language before you have that. I love that. Okay, dang. So now your 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 primary business is this thing that started with a couple people showing up, where you're just teaching people. Are, are you teaching them how to get gigs or how to speak? How to land the contract. So essentially how sales. To land the contract. Okay, gotcha. So gotcha. We're, te we're, we're teaching them sales, how to land the contract, how to sell. And in the beginning, it was, ve it was very narrow, like how to sell to colleges. Then it went how to sell to colleges and corporations. Then it went how to sell in general, because a lot of our clients are like, look, I need a business model that has coaching, that has speaking, that has consulting. I don't want to be boxed in because in, like, it, depending on what the economy does, you may want to have a coaching business where you can go direct to consumer. And then you may also want to have a few corporate contracts that are bringing in a revenue stream as well. Hmm. So now we just teach sales generally. And really it's the same process. Like we do webinars for corporations. Like it's the same, it's a very similar sales process, but sales is literally transference of belief. So you have to be able Whoa, to transfer slow that. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> Exp explain that one more time. The definition, our, my definition of sales is the transference of belief. The transference of belief. Yeah. Sales is the transference of belief. Yes. And the more you believe, the more they will buy. And not, not fake belief. Like, oh, I'm a believer. But then all your actions are not in alignment with it. Like our, the currency of confidence is like your, it, it's a formula for building confidence. So your thoughts literally become your beliefs. Mm -hmm. You hold your beliefs in your heart, but they show up in your feet. So what you believe you do, if you say you believe something and you don't do it, you're lying. If I say I love my husband, but I'm out here in these streets, I'm lying. Mm -hmm. I don't love him. You know what I mean? And so he won't believe it. Right. And I ain't never in these streets. You know, I love my man. <laughs> but like literally, it's all about what you believe. And even with a book, if I didn't believe anyone would buy the book or read the book, I wouldn't have wrote it. But what mm -hmm. happens with most people is they believe a little bit. So they write the book and then they market a little bit. You market at the level of your belief. You sell at the level of your belief. You work at the level of your belief. Like I wake up in the morning on charge because I believe I'm here to change the world. Yeah. Like, I don't think I'm here to make money. Like that feels dumb. Why would God, like, I don't think God, I think God loves us having money, but I'm not in the camp of like, if you're rich, God loves you more. And I think that is a flawed sales process that's out in the marketplace. Oh, God wants you to have money. So if you broke, 
God don't love that. He don't love you because you don't have no. I don't. I don't believe he's up there in yeah. heaven. Like, show me your bank account. Where the receipts? You know <laughs> what I mean? I do believe God is like her biggest witness is going to come from being successful because it's a draw. And as long as her heart is towards me, then I can work with that. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. So I don't. I believe that people will listen to me more because we made millions at that event. And so it was important to me to make millions at that event so I could attract the right people at the right time to get the right transformation. I believe I could have changed their lives when I was making $100,000, but they wouldn't have heard it the same. Yeah. So I had to make the millions so they would pay more attention. Goodness gracious. I So the 2020, and it's so interesting because 2021, no, 2022, two point something, 2021, how, how much did you make in the event? 450? 450,000. Mm -hmm. Right around there. Nearly, it was like an 8X growth. So 2022 was when we did the 2.6. 2021 was 450 um, from the event, like with upsells and, and tickets and all of that. And then 2022, 2021, like and then 2020 pandemic. was our first six figure launch. So 2020 okay. was the first time where we made a couple, like over a hundred thousand dollars from like a webinar. Cause we had to do it all virtually and gotcha. it was only 55 people there. Mm. Y'all got kids? One daughter now. She was born and oh, for all my moms, I was doing this event in 2020 while pumping. Like the recording is like, zzz, zzz, zzz. <laughs> and I'm like selling and pumping. I was like, it is what it is. And like, it's a lot of women in my community. They're like, is that the pump? Which one you got? And I'm like, they need to focus. <laughs> like, like 2020, our daughter was born May 2020. And we did the event virtually. And originally it was going to be in person. And the first time we announced it was going to go virtual, almost everyone who had a ticket at that time was like, well, I'm canceling. I want my money back, uh, blah, blah, blah. There. And so I was really nervous. And I, I asked my husband, I was like, maybe we should cancel it. And he was like, no, you're not canceling the event. And at the time he hadn't come on full time. And in 2020, I basically started like begging him, like, come, like, help me come to the company. He was like, where's my offer letter? Like he, he don't be playing with me like that. He's like, because I'm like, it's gonna be great, and we're gonna build this million dollar seven figure entrepreneurs. That's gonna be us. He's like, great. Where's my offer letter with my benefits? Like, <laughs> and and literally, I thought that it wasn't. I I told Ash this on Inside the Vault. I thought like he wasn't supporting me, but he was really protecting me. Yeah. So what looked like a lack of support was really him protecting me from moving too fast and putting our relationship at risk, because. Mm. We have been broke before, but only when like our expenses were real low. Yeah. Not <laughs> we like it wasn't now. You know right, what I mean? Right. Like now it's like we got real bills. People want to get paid on time. It's mm. crazy. Every month they That's want crazy. the same thing. So <laughs> it's like now I think that it'd be different. So he was very much like, okay, write out an offer letter, write out a plan. When the business hits this marker, then you can join. Um, don't shut down your law firm yet. Like really keep going. So mm. I started accepting that he, I just, I was listening to something. They were like, you need to believe your husband loves you regardless. If you have a good man, this doesn't yeah. always work disclaimer, but like for me, it works. <laughs> so I was like, I believe he loves me. I'm going to start listening to what he says. And every time I did, the business made more money, things got better. And I started realizing like, I sometimes can hear God through my husband wow. because he has my best interest at heart and he's a protector in nature. Yeah. So he didn't join until, I don't know, February of, 21. 21. Gotcha. He joined full time, left his job. And um, that is when everything changed. Like he joined full time February 2021. It got crazy at first. Right. Lots of disagree because it was just like I've been doing it on my own and now I have a business partner. Um, and then it started getting good when we shut down the firm and got aligned on we're going to grow this business. Yeah. And he was like, you can't make all your money. The first change he made in the business was you can't make all your money from one event if this is going to be our main business. We have to start doing more events. We have to start launching more. And last year we did like 16 launches, like virtual and in-person events. Right. And we just went all the way because we didn't have a backup plan. He yeah. left his job. I shut down my law firm. I told people I'm not taking no legal clients anymore. I wasn't going back to work at this point. We had revenue generating companies um, and we had to make the millions in one business in one way, like this was, we had to, yeah. <laughs> like it wasn't, it wasn't another option and everything wow. changed in the business. Oh my gosh. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. 
Actually, before before we go, I, w- I want to wrap up, but I, d- I do want to give our um, uh, people who aspire to uh, get contracts and like really go into schools or, you know, like be able to monetize their voice, yeah. know, monetize, you know, their, their brain. So give me like three things that people need, like just some, some game that you can give out right now. Three things that will really, really help somebody secure some gigs. Okay, great. One, you should use LinkedIn. This is something we talk a lot about in the Picture Way to Cash oh, Challenge. LinkedIn, man. Not you that got, I hate you it. You should it's just, use it, but just I link, like, it. It's like it's easy. Just go in the LinkedIn DM. So go to a studio, go somewhere that well lit that looks nice, like this studio. Very like nice. This studio, the very nice. Clubhouse.com. <laughs> Absolutely, very you nice. Know? And have someone record you talking for five minutes about your framework, your formula for the result that you want to sell. Take that video, put it in Loom, and add a button in Loom. Get get the paid version. But, like, add a little button in Loom where they can book a consult with you if they watch the video and you can track who watches the video. Gotcha. Go on LinkedIn and say, hey, Sarah, I see that you are a student activities director. I do quite a bit of speaking. I want to share with you. Um, I want to share our framework with you. No questions asked. Go ahead and click this link. It's not going to ask you for an email or anything. Check it out. And if it sounds good and you want to bring it in next quarter, book a call with me. Do that 10 times a day for student activities directors and you will start getting appointments on your calendar. Mm -hmm. You want to have three to five sales conversations a week with people who've already seen proof that you're good at what you do. You don't want to get on the phone with anyone that has not at least seen you speak. Mm. You don't want it to be cold, cold. That's good. Cause I don't, I'm not about to convince you that I know how to speak. Like we're not about to be on the call. Like, well, are you engaging? No. Like we need to talk about money. We talk about your pain points. We need to talk about how we can bring this in. And so I would do that. I do the same thing with um, colleges and corporations. And we tell our clients to do the same Mm -hmm. things with both. And once you book that one time speech, do the speech after you do the speech, poll the audience about what the audience wants to see next Mm -hmm. and give them three options. All of which you provide like workshop, one day intensive or multi-day like, retreat like pretty much what do you want from me yeah what do you want from me and gotcha. then you do a follow-up call and you're gonna sell it to them as like hey i want to do this um follow-up call to make sure things are being implemented well okay cool do a follow-up call with them and say hey your audience wants to see a workshop and an intensive next yep. this is their clients either their students or their employees and then you ask all right which one works for you for the next quarter Wow. So you're going back to the person that just booked you to say, hey, your audience said they want me to come do this. This is the corporate upsell. I love that. That is brilliant. Yeah. And that one, because the goal is the 510K on the front end isn't a lot of money. So like for someone like you and other seven figure business owners that are watching, it's not appealing to go get five or 10K, which is why most of us will go and speak to market because we run ads. So we know it costs me $150 to get a customer. So for me, if I go to an event with 2000 entrepreneurs and I waive my fee, but I could get 2000 leads, that's coming out of my marketing budget. I'm sponsoring that event because it saves me marketing dollars. Like it was just, I get it. It, It's, it's, it's money like, you know, (laughs) five, $10,000, but to, if I already have a business that is doing well, that takes away for like, I'll actually lose money flying out there, go yes. there $5,000. I got to come back and then. Oh, flying yeah. out. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. It needs to be close if you got, cause it has to all make sense. But this way you use your five or $10,000 as the pricey opt-in. That's what we call it in the speak your way to cash book. Pricey opt-in is that, like that five to 15 K initial engagement. But that follow-up data is really what gets you to the six figure contract mm. and beyond. And then you sell the we, so you don't deliver the contract. Like your job isn't to go and then deliver all the pieces of the contract. Your job is to then go staff it with consultants and other speakers that didn't do all this marketing work, which is the real work. Mm -hmm. They just get to do the fun part, but you get paid more. Not because you're taking advantage of them, but because marketing always costs more. You have real expenses. And you're running a business. That's how a business operates. That's how a business operates. Dang, this is good. Thank you so much. That's what I'd recommend. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I, you got my, my speaking fire back. Cause I like really for like the last year, I just took off speaking. Like be like, yo, will you come? But eh. especially I got kids at the house. Yeah. I, I do not like it because every time I leave and come back, my daughter says Different. another new word. Yeah. Like, it's like, how you, where you learn that when I was gone? Yeah. But I think I am going to get uh, back in these streets. Cause I do enjoy 
the education. And and take, I, take your daughter with you. Get a traveling nanny and take her with you. Hmm? Take her with you. They have traveling nannies that will literally like take your kids with you. I take, I, for a while, we took our daughter and our nanny everywhere if we had to travel just because I didn't want to miss anything. Yeah. So you have options. I like being home. I get it. But you know, I keep saying that and I'm really going to like miss out on opportunities because I'm learning this whole manifestation thing. <laughs> You don't want to miss out. You don't want to miss out on opportunities, but you should have a list. So what we do is we have a checklist. If I'm going to do an event Mm -hmm. and if I'm waving my fee or I'm speaking to market, I need to know who else spoke there. What's the, what's the caliber of people? Do they collect, like we collect income data on our clients. So we know exactly who's in our audience. Do they do that? Like what, who am I talking to? Cause you could talk to 2000 of the wrong people. And you're not going to make nothing. No way. So speaking to market doesn't make sense. So Chris could be in the back of the room all day long. And he's going to be like, not working out, you know? So mm. you really, if you speak to market, you do have to really qualify the audience. And if it's not worth it for you to travel, then have a list where it's like, only if they hit these parameters, yeah. will we even consider it? Yeah. I love this. Yo, thank you so much. First off, <laughs> I I, I want to know, I, I got to ask you this question as we can clo- uh, close. What do you see yourself accomplishing in the next five years? Mm. And be careful though, because this video and this audio will be up five years from today, mm-hmm. which means I want to be able to watch this or listen to this episode in five years to say, Ashley said she was going to do that five years ago. Look, she did it. Mm. Five years. What do you know you're going to accomplish within the next five, five, in five years from today? Man, that's tough. How many more kids, Chris? Oh, none. I know that. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> I'm oh, one and done you. out here in these streets. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely, we we both are in agreement on that. So that's, oh, that's an easy one. So our daughter will be older. I really see us, uh, I, the only, my only apprehension mm-hmm. is I hate limiting my dreams mm. with the capacity of only my imagination. That's good. I want God to imagine some stuff that's for me. That's a really good answer. I want to get everything he ever gave me, then I want him to imagine some more stuff for me. Yeah. What I can imagine right now, which I'm praying is like, this is not the cap, this is the floor, is a nine-figure executive sales coaching company, um, the largest black mastermind filled with black women experts who are literally changing industries and the world, um, an incredible marriage that just gets better and better every single second of every single day, a great relationship with my daughter, really good relationship with Christ, but making an impact of teaching people how to monetize their expertise and be bold. Even when the world wants to muzzle you. Goodness gracious. I have not heard a better answer. That was good. Thank you so much. So real quick, I want to, again, thank you on behalf of me because I know I learned a lot and uh, from our audience and um, how can how can like people connect with you or work with you or how does it work? Definitely. So they can meet me every month. We do a challenge, the Pitch Your Way to Cash Challenge. Mm-hmm. So they can come to that at pitchyourwaytocash.com. And they can join me for free in the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook group and pick up the book or the podcast at Speak Your Way to Cash. All right. There it is. Listen, man, make sure y'all follow oh, your Instagram. At the Ashley Nicole Show. Make sure... Okay, where's the Ashley Nicole show thing come from? Well, because I was in corporate for so long, I didn't want to use my last name. So whenever I did anything entrepreneurial, I went by Ashley Nicole. And whenever I did anything from my job, I would go by Ashley Kirkwood, just so that the algorithm couldn't get me caught up. Well, where's the show part come from? I've always wanted to have my own show. So I had a YouTube show originally. My first platform was like a YouTube show. Why isn't this in your five years? I... That's why you that, don't have the show because it's not in your five years. Right. That you were because you had to tell me that nugget so I that's could deposit it and that's in the five years. I'm the greatest coach in the world. <laughs> All right. Make sure y'all rock with Ashley. <laughs> make sure you go follow her. Okay. Uh let her know in the DMs how you felt about this interview. Um <laughs> and uh, again, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And uh lastly, if you could close us out with a word of wisdom, okay. There, there's somebody out there that um they're ready, they're fired up. But for some reason, they can't get their feet to move and do something. What do you say to them? Every day you can, do it for every day you can't. Never be so arrogant as to assume you have time. 
So every day you wake up with breath in your body, activity of your limbs, go all in. And that will allow you to store up the energy for the days where you genuinely physically can't. Because those days come for most of us. And so every day you can, do it for every day you can't. There it is. We can't close it out no better than that. Do yourself a favor. Make sure you go follow the show, okay? Ashley Nicole Show. Um, and also go get you some social proof, meaning go build something. But you got to bring that information back to your community. Teach them how you did it because it's the only way our community grows, okay? We are out of here. Peace. That was good. If you like the video that you just watched, click this one. You're going to like this one, maybe even more. Click it right now.